Hi, my name is Jennifer Ceruta, and I'm an assistant professor in entomology and plant pathology. Today I'll be talking to you about the importance of pollinators for agriculture and conservation biology. Many people understand the value of pollinators in terms of agriculture, but these two pictures really show how important pollinators are for our day-to-day -day diet. So these show what a breakfast looks like with and without pollinators, and the picture on the right is missing many important things, such as the fruits, the fruit jelly, fruit juice, um, fruits and nuts in that granola mix, as well as coffee creamer. And that coffee creamer is an indirect benefit of pollinators through the pollination of livestock feed. And it's been estimated that about one out of every three bites of food that we take has somehow benefited through animal pollination. Another interesting statistic is that the value of United States crops that result from insect pollination is $29 billion. It's actually a little bit more than $29 billion. That's huge. And of that, honeybees, which are my specialty, um, contribute over $19 billion of that amount. And while honeybees are an important pollinator, we do want to mention and value all of these other types of pollinators that exist in the world. Um, there are many different types. Um, the, one of the less value types, but is so important, is the wind. Um, wind pollinated crops are very important for many of our diets. Um, such crops like corn and wheat are, are really huge. Uh, but of the animal pollinated crops, um, we have many different types of animals that do that pollination. Um, we have many types of birds, bats, but especially insects that do pollination for our crops. Um, this collage here shows different types of insect pollinators, and you'll see that there are many types of bees. And I'll talk about honeybees a little bit later. I'm not showing them in these pictures here because I have so many other types of bees to show. But you also see that there are wasps and there are flies and there are beetles that all contribute to pollination. So they're really important in terms of getting um, diverse crops pollinated. We need to have diverse pollinators as well. And specifically with bees, there's been a lot of research that shows how important different bee species are and how they interact um, and how this interaction between these bees can affect yield. And so this was a nice study um, done in sunflowers that showed that um, honeybees alone were increasing the pollination of the hybrid um, sunflower seed production. But when you added wild bees into the landscape, the pollination levels went up even more. So really having the interaction between these two types or these many types of bees um, really helped increase the yields here. And when we talk about wild bees, we're talking about probably over 4,000 species of bees in the United States. And I say probably because we haven't described or even um, seen all of them yet. So it's estimated to be around 4,000 species in the United States. Another interesting study that came out of North Carolina State University um, shows how important different types of bees are because of their different traits. Um, in this case, they're looking at a blueberry system and they showed how different types of bees contribute to pollination in different ways because of different traits and behaviors of those bees. And so they were looking at not only the abundance, the number of the types of bees, but also how efficient they were in terms of pollinating those blueberries, um, activity patterns, how often they visited, and how those species interacted with one another. And the important takeaway message from the study is that all of these types of, all of these different types of bees were all valuable in different ways. And so it's really helpful to have a diversity of bees out there and not just any one given type. When we talk about the value of pollinators, we oftentimes think about fruits and vegetables. That's the obvious one. And this collage um, shows some of the um, really great fruits and vegetables that we have growing in the Southeast region. But we really wanna think about pollination in terms of um, other, beyond the um, agro ecosystem, in terms of fruit and vegetable production to other types of production out in the field. And so one really great benefit of pollinators is through their production of seeds that can be used for propagation um, of more plants, but also for things like oil. So the picture on the left-hand side is of canola, and you can see a honeybee working one of those flowers there. Um, and canola is a really common oil that gets used for cooking. And um, bees and other types of pollinators also um, are involved in the pollination of plants that produce fibers for us. Um, some of those fibers are used for raw materials, such as clothing, uh, and some of those um, fibers or plant uh, vegetation are used to feed livestock. 
And so the picture on the right here is of a bumblebee working alfalfa. Um, and there's actually a really important alfalfa leaf cutter bee, so not a bumblebee, but another type of bee that's responsible for most of the alfalfa seed production um, in the United States, and then indirectly alfalfa hay. So there are lots of different types of pollinators out there. Some of them specialize on certain types of plants and some are generalists like honeybees. It's also important for farmers to understand the value of some of these cover crops that we plant out in the field um, for pollinators. So many of these cover crops, um, here I'm showing buckwheat, uh, the white flowers, as well as crimson clover, uh, because they're really important sources of nectar and pollen for pollinators. Um, nectar provides carbohydrates and pollen provides protein. Um, it's also really important to provide diverse floral resources because different plant species provide different um, amino acids through the pollen, as well as different nutritional values. So we like to have a diverse floral landscape to ensure that we are covering all the nutritional needs of bees and other pollinators out in the landscape. Um, beyond nutrition, there's a lot of research, recent research that's been showing the importance of floral resources on bees' ability to um, deal with viral infections, as well as pathogen levels, um, and how it also affects their lifespan and their susceptibility to pesticides later on in life. So when you're thinking about planting cover crops for soil health, know that you're also helping and supporting pollinators and pollinator health. Um, and here's just a close up of a honeybee working some crimson clover and you can see that um, pollen load on her hind leg, um, the really dark brown there. And it's not to um, you know, harp on this, but this is the Milan no-till field day. And so it's really important to think about those ground nesting bees because they nest in the ground. Um, about 70% of native bees do nest in the ground. So oftentimes you don't notice the, their nests unless you're out there looking for them or know what to look for. Um, in some ways, these nests are aerating the soil and decreasing compaction. Um, but it's also uh, something to keep in mind if you're growing crops um, that need ground nesting bees for pollination, such as squashes, um, you really want to be careful about how you manage and treat your landscape um, and how you um, till or don't till. And if you are going to till, to avoid deep tilling because you can destroy these nests that are in the ground um, and therefore destroy your pollinators that you're going to need for crop production. Um, and here's just a short little video showing one of these cute ground nesting bees with pollen going in um, so she can start her, her nest down there. So really inconspicuous nests. But next time you're out in the field, try and take a look and see if you notice um, some openings out there. Sometimes they're obvious and you'll have large aggregations of nests and other times they'll just be individual separated nests out there. But take the time to look down at the ground and see if you notice any bees coming in and out. So now I'm gonna switch gears and take a couple minutes to talk about the importance of pollinators in natural landscapes. So uh, while we do see different plants and animals in natural areas, um, here we have the tulip poplar on the left and on the right hand side some swallowtails and I took both of those pictures at the Smoky Mountain National Park last year. Pollination is just as important here as in agricultural landscapes. Uh, pollinators help in propagating plants in these areas as well as producing food for wildlife through the, the fruits and the plant propagation, but also because those pollinators can serve as direct prey for some of the wildlife. Um, and the, the pollinators themselves will also, in through propagating plants, maintain the wildlife um, habitat. So we really want to think about the role of pollinators in agriculture and food security, but also in terms of um, securing wildlife and wildland areas. Uh, many of us enjoy the natural landscapes for recreation, and part of that comes from um, the enjoyment of, of the surrounding flora and, and fauna that we see out there. Um, and so it's really important for these areas to have pollinators that help conserve these diverse plants, some of which are threatened. Um, even plants that can be spread through vegetative propagation can benefit through pollination um, by animals because of the spread of seeds. So the, the seed production, as well as spread through things like birds that will um, drop the seeds in one way or another, can help increase the numbers of these plants, but also the distribution and spread of these plants throughout the environment. So we really want to think about um, how these diverse plant communities can conserve um, diverse insect communities, as well as larger animal communities in the landscape. Um, and here's just a short little video showing how my pollinator habitat that I put out can also support wildlife. 
So even though I planted this with the intention of feeding my bees, I'm also feeding a lot of birds that are out in the environment. And some of this comes through the production of berries and fruits and seed from insect pollinated plants, but also the larvae and adults of many uh, pollinator species can serve as um, important dietary staples for birds out in the environment. So pollinator habitat serves many functions, um, also in promoting soil health, preventing soil erosion and runoff, um, but also in terms of conserving beneficial insects and natural enemies um, that can feed on pest insects. So there are many different ways that pollinator habitat can serve in other ecosystem services. And pollinators um, are really important for home life too. So whether you have a home garden or not, um, home gardens are fantastic and hopefully we've all been taking advantage of spending more time at home and producing some of our own food. Um, but also thinking about how pollinators impact us beyond just the production of fruits and vegetables and fibers that you may be wearing right now. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to highlight um, honeybee products. Again, honeybees are my specialty and they are an interesting animal for um, not only the pollination services, but the other products we can gather from their hives. Um, obviously the, the number one product here we can talk about is honey. And so we oftentimes are using honey as a sweetener um, in cooking, but we can also use it for medicinal purposes, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, pollen is also you know, a readily available source in healthy honeybee colonies, and we can also um, harvest some of the pollen from those colonies as well. And some people consume um, a, a small dose of pollen to help with their um, allergies. Honeybees also produce wax, so they actually have glands on their abdomens that produce little um, pellets of wax and that's how they make their honeycomb. And we can also collect and process that wax um, to use for the production of candles, as well as um, use in soaps and lotions and, and cosmetics. We can also use the, uh, the honey in a different way. So we can ferment honey to make a sweet wine. Um, and so this has been growing, um, mead is what it's called, and it's been growing in popularity um, also because it has not been, um, or it does not have the same reaction in folks who have um, allergies to grains because this is a non-grain alcohol. So there are lots of different types of products that we can get from the hive, but I wanna to touch again on that medicinal purpose for just a second, because many of us don't think about honey in that way, but it can be therapeutic. Um, there are antimicrobial qualities to honey. Um, honeys can contain hydrogen peroxide as well as antioxidants. And so these chemical properties can be um, useful in other realms. So honey is not just a food product, but it can also be used as a wound and burn treatment and e even for non-humans. So here um, is the sea turtle that's getting a wound dressing um, of um, a honey um, ointment. I, I'm not sure, not sure the best way to call that, but um, a dressing of honey um, on its shell to help with um, healing its wounds there. Um, so I want to just lastly touch on the importance of pollinators in terms of the future and inspiring new, or new farmers and naturalists. So honeybees are a really hot topic um, and there's a lot of interest from diverse audiences right now, including youth. Um, and this is a really great way to introduce opportunities to the young and older audiences, but especially the young who may not otherwise be considering futures in the field and futures mean careers, but also just hobbies, getting out and um, growing um, pollinator plots or growing your own vegetables and going out and enjoying pollinators out in the natural landscape. So I'm oftentimes um, in my extension appointment working with kids and trying to give them the opportunity to get up close and personal with bees in a safe and contained way. So here through an observation hive where they can see the bees behaving somewhat normally. They can't fly out, um, but they can watch the bees feeding um, the young. They can watch the queen laying eggs. They can watch a lot of bee biology happening right in front of their eyes in a really safe way. And we can talk about bees in a really fun way, make learning um, exciting um, and, and not just as, as we are now giving a presentation. Um, I also try to give them an opportunity to taste different types of honey. So different honey varieties from different types of plants taste differently. And it's also a really great way to explain to them how honey goes from nectar from plants through the bees and through the colony into the jar and how that entire process um, requires a lot of work on the side of the bees, but also on the side of the beekeeper. 
Um, so that kind of gives a little more perspective to what honey is and um, the amount of work it takes to, to produce that one jar of honey. Um, lastly, I, I like to give them the opportunity to play the part of a beekeeper. And so if they feel like they're a part of it and they're engaged. Um, and it also makes learning um, about bees, uh, I think a little more uh, personal. And it also provides a way for them to learn about bees and, and understand that they aren't just scary stinging insects, but that they really do contribute a lot to um, human society. Um, and lastly, I think it really makes um, beekeeping and the idea of pollination and agriculture really fun. And so that's what I really like um, seeing the kids take away from it is that um, agriculture can be fun. A lot of kids don't even think about going into agriculture unless their family has already been involved in agriculture. But I think there's a lot of opportunity here for us to reach out um, and get some new folks into agriculture. And that also brings new ideas into the field as well. So pollinators are invaluable for a number of reasons, um, not only in agriculture um, and natural landscapes, but also for shaping and supporting the future of our lands as well as our youth. So I'm gonna end with just a few slides of some resources. So um, I wanna advertise my program um, with the University of Tennessee's Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, I coordinate the Master Beekeeping Program. Um, although we don't have classes planned um, for this season because of the COVID-19 situation, but when we do have updates and we do have classes, they will be posted on my website. And there's also other educational offerings listed on my website as well. Um, we, I am involved in a stay at home beekeeping webinar series that's been ongoing since April and um, information about that is um, on my website. And I, was, I also have some nice Zoom backgrounds related to pollinators if you're interested and wanna spice up your, your latest virtual meeting with um, colleagues. I also wanna point out who to contact for different um, issues involving bees or pollinators. So UT Extension handles um, education and um, ag research, which is also part of the UT Institute of Agriculture, handles research. Um, so we are focused on education and research, and we also have county offices across the, the state where you can um, find your um, local extension agent who's a great resource for you and answering questions about pollinators and beekeeping and anything related to agriculture. So um, I rec recommend that you check out the website utextension.tennessee.edu um, to find your county office and your local ag agent. And then I also wanna point out that the Tennessee Department of Ag has um, programs related to pollinators and um, bees. So if you are a beekeeper, hopefully you're familiar with the Tennessee Department of Ag um, and their apiary inspection services, as well as permit services um, and the need to get certification before you move your bees within the state or outside of the state. So getting those permits are really important. And we also have this phone number here at the bottom for um, pesticide use. So I really want to encourage everyone to write this phone number down because this is the number that you call for anything regarding pesticides. Um, but especially if you are a beekeeper who suspects a possible bee kill um, due to pesticides, this is the phone number you need to call. And these investigations are really time sensitive. So um, this, is, this, this is who you need to contact immediately. So I just wanna make sure that everybody has um, that resource available, available to them, as well as just knowing that we have a lot of support for pollinators and bees across the state, but we also need your support. Um, we want to encourage that everybody plant some pollinator habitat out there and manage it in a pollinator friendly way. And so the other two talks in the session will talk about pollinator habitat and how you manage it um, in a way and using pesticides safely and practicing integrated pest management. But I think my takeaway message from all of this is to think about pollinators and how they impact your day-to-day -day life and think about how you can feed and support pollinators so they can help feed and support us as well as other animals out in the environment. So I just wanna thank you guys all for your time and your support. I'm gonna leave you with a buzzing page and I hope that I can meet you guys in the future soon, in person. Thank you so much, bye-bye.